the Carmarthenshire settlement of St Clair's is not the place you might expect a criminal to set up in business. But then, I suppose, that's why it was chosen. In the early years of the 19th century, it unexpectedly found it had played host to a criminal and his family, who repaid the friendship and hospitality of its inhabitants in forged bank notes. These events took place just over 200 years ago, so getting to the bottom of exactly what went on isn't possible. In telling this story, I'm relying on hearsay reported in the Victorian book by Mary Curtis, whose informant was an elderly lady, a Mrs Traherne of Larne. Mrs Traherne, when a young Miss Thomas, lived in a house in St Clair's opposite the crime scene and claimed to have witnessed the events she related. This is the story as she told it. In spring 1817, or possibly 1816, a party arrived by coach at the White Lion, comprising a fine lady who used crutches, her son, two more gentlemen, her nephews, her daughter, a great beauty, and they all settled at St Clair's, renting Cook's house, later known as White Cottage at the Larne end of Bridge Street, not far from the church and close to the house of the young Miss Thomas mentioned earlier. The newly arrived Baines family proved popular and received many visitors, including from the local gentry. Everyone was charmed by them, particularly by the alluring young Miss Baines. The nephews, called Thompson, and the pretty daughter became part of local society but Mrs Baines and her son William stayed at home. In fact, William Baines spent most of his time in a small room, windows permanently obscured, where he claimed to be carrying out experiments in chemistry. His mother set up her sitting room next to this supposed laboratory, which was always kept locked. The spectacularly naive people of St Clair's saw nothing suspicious in this arrangement, nor in Mr Baines' habit of only taking air and exercise at night, nor in the Baines family habit of placing lavish orders with the local tradespeople and always paying in fresh banknotes. In fact, so much food was ordered by the residents of White Cottage that they kindly offered their surplus to their neighbours, who paid them for it in coin. The vicar found a pocket book stuffed with banknotes in the road and advertised that it could be claimed from him by its unfortunate owner, but no one ever turned up to ask for it back. Meanwhile, at a Carmarthen bank, two notes were presented which did arouse suspicion. They both had the same number on them, otherwise they were almost identical, the forgery being an excellent copy. The Bank of England were also finding well-executed forgeries turning up and were obviously keen to find out where they originated. Mrs Traherne's brother was a lawyer who had his suspicions about the Baines family and tipped off the partners of the Carmarthen Bank who drove past to have a look. The chemical experiments suddenly ceased, the locked room was opened and some odd midnight gardening went on. Mr William Baines went to Bath for his health suddenly and the rest of the family made plans to join him there. After about six months of living, fancy and payment free at St Clair's, they'd realised the game was up. Indeed it was. In their flight they paid their coach fare to Bath with, inevitably, forged notes and unfortunately for them, one of the partners of the bank was there, examined the notes and got a warrant to arrest the whole fraudulent family who never did get on their coach. William Baines was taken at Bristol in possession of forged banknotes and, fatally, the means of making them. They were all locked up in Carmarthen Jail awaiting trial, which didn't occur until the next year. The daughter's admirers continued to visit her despite her imprisonment. Her brother, William Baines, claimed he alone was guilty to spare the lives of the rest of his family, for forgery was, in 1817, a hanging offence. No mention is made in the story of what happened to the nephews. William Baines was convicted and executed, and Miss Baines went to London. As she enjoyed a brief career as an actress, 
went on to Switzerland as a governess and then as a companion to a countess in Florence, where she met and married an English nobleman. How much of this story has been embroidered, I can't really say, but it appears to be broadly correct. The contemporary accounts I can find are in the Cambrian newspaper. In the issue of the 28th of March, 1818, it is said that the great sessions at Carmarthen would include the trial of William Baines, Andrew Johnson, Henry Johnson, the cousins of Mr Baines who lived with them at St Clair's, who were called Thompson by Mrs Traherne, and also one David Jones, presumably a local man. In the issue of 4th of April 1818, which covers the trial, it's reported that William Baines was tried alongside his cousin, named as Andrew Jackson. It confirms he was taken at Bristol, having fled St Clair's, by the guard of the Bristol and Milford Mail, and found in possession of a complete forging apparatus. Witnesses confirmed they had been paid by him in forged notes. Baines admitted he had made the notes, but offered the highly improbable and rather pathetic defence that he'd done it to replace some he'd accidentally burned, and had no intention of defrauding the bank or any individual. Andrew Johnson's witnesses said he'd inherited £400 per year after his father's death in 1816 and he had respectable family connections, and he was acquitted. But Baines was sentenced to death, after which he rather surprisingly offered to tell the Bank of England how to make their notes impossible to forge. I don't know if they took up his offer, but they had sent an inspector of notes to Carmarthen to help convict him. William Baines' confession had saved his family. His mother and sister, Jane and Elizabeth Baines, were originally sentenced to death, but pardoned and given a year in prison instead. Whether his sister really did marry an aristocratic husband, I don't know. Seems unlikely. William Baines was not pardoned. He was executed at the Carmarthen Jail, not at Pensan, as had been the practice earlier. In fact, he was the first to be executed by the new arrangement outside the jail. He was executed on Saturday the 23rd of May, 1818, by hanging. This was engraved by him while he was in Carmarthen Jail, where he apparently still had engraving equipment. Pro bono publico, in the public good. What a pity! that he hadn't used his evident talent for something that really was in the public good. I hope you enjoyed this story of the St Clair's Forgery Gang. If so, please remember to click the like button. And as always, thank you for watching.